Hey folks, as I keep on saying, we're having a retreat in two weekends from now at the Angel City Zen Center that will be online on Zoom so all of you can join it. Also, go to the angelcitiesendcenter.org to find out about all the other things we're doing. We're having a Halloween party on Saturday too, and you can join that if you want to as well. And I might sing a song at that, so that'll be exciting. So, what I want to talk to you about today that's a weird sound. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's a sound like a dog barking, but it sounds like an outer space weird dog. Any case, the thing I want to talk to you about today is desire and fear and whether those things belong to us. And I want to talk about something else too, because it's about the concept of a turning word. Are those coyotes? I don't know what those are. The phrase turning word shows up in a lot of koans, and it's usually uh, the, the Zen master says something to the student, and it's a turning word. It, uh, it appears very significantly in the fox koan, the Hyakujo's fox, which I've talked about a lot, and I'm not going to talk about right now again, but Hyakujo's fox, a famous koan. And in that, the master says a turning word to the person who has been changed into a fox for 500 lifetimes. For me, a lot of turning words have been in this book, which I say slightly apologetically because it's outside of the Zen tradition. It's in the Advaita Vedanta tradition. And I was unaware of this book, like completely unaware of this book until... I don't know, March or April of this year, when I asked my first teacher, Tim, if he could recommend me any books in the Advaita Vedanta tradition that he thought were good. Uh, I, I was just kind of interested in studying up on it, you know, because it was something, you know, that's sort of in my mind. I thought I'd study up on Advaita Vedanta, and he happened to recommend I Am That by Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj. Well, last night, no, no, not last night, a couple of nights ago, I happened to turn to page 419. I've read this book, uh, this is my second go-through, so I'm on page 419, so I'm about at the end of my second read-through of this book, and I might read it again, <laughs> because it's that good. And it's a very funny little document, I think. It's a set of dialogues by this guy, Nisargadatta Maharaj, who had about a fourth grade education, owned a little cigarette shop. Apparently he'd owned a chain of cigarette shops, little tiny like bodegas. I don't know if you'd even like consider them like a convenience store, but they were in, in India, these little tiny shops. And he went off in his uh, ages of, in his thirties, uh, to a spiritual quest and found a guru. And during the time that he was on this quest, all but one of his shops went out of business because he wasn't managing them very well because he was more interested in this spiritual quest. But he came back and he just started running his little cigarette shop again, the one that was left. And people gradually found out about him and started going and talking to him. And eventually, it wasn't just Indian people, it was people from all over the world, and he had a translator. But this whole time, he just kept a, a little apartment in Bombay, as it was called back then, which is now called Mumbai, and uh, received people uh, t twice a day, I think they say, uh, for a couple hours each time, and, and had little conversations with them, and that's what he did. He never opened a center or tried to you know, aggrandize himself or anything like that. He just talked to people. And what he came out with is so amazing. But the, the thing that I read the other night, I'm going to read to you. And the reason I brought up the concept of the turning word is because a turning word has to come to a certain person at a certain time in a certain place. It doesn't, a turning word isn't a magic uh, formula. It's not like abracadabra, I can't even say it, abracadabra or alakazam or something like that that, that works every time. It's, it, it works when it works. And this one works so well for me that I've read it five or ten times so far over the last three or four days since I noticed it. And I must have read it earlier. That This is the point I was making about when I said, ah, I'm all scattered now. This is the point I was trying to make when I said I'd read the book twice through. Uh, the first time through, uh, I, I made a lot of notes about... Uh, certain parts that, that I thought were good, I didn't make any notes about this chapter. So the first time through, I must not have even noticed this chapter. You know, I, I read it, but it didn't really strike me. And the second time through, I'm like, oh my god, that is amazing. So I don't know how this will be. Your mileage may vary, as they say on the commercials in America. 
Let's just read it. I'm not going to read you the question. I'll just read you the answers to two questions that I thought were really good. As long as there is the body and the sense of identity with the body, frustration is inevitable. Only when you know yourself as entirely alien to it and different from the body will you find respite from the mixture of fear and craving inseparable from the I am the body idea. Now here's the part that got me. Merely assuaging fears and satisfying desires will not remove this sense of emptiness you are trying to escape from. Only self-knowledge can help you. By self-knowledge, in quotes, I mean full knowledge of what you are not. Such knowledge is attainable and final, but to the discovery of what you are, there can be no end. The more you discover, the more there remains to discover. And then a little bit further down, he says, You cannot change your circumstances, but you can change your attitudes. You need not be attached to the non-essentials. Only the necessary is good. There is peace only in the essential. And then a little bit further down, he says, Your desire just happens to you. Along with its fulfillment or non-fulfillment, you can change neither. You may believe that you exert yourself, strive and struggle. Again, it all merely happens, including the fruits of the work. Nothing is by you or for you. All is in the picture exposed on the cinema screen. Nothing is in the light, including what you take yourself to be, the person. You are the light only. Now that allusion there, in case you don't quite follow it, kind of follows on from something earlier, he says, or something he apparently said a lot, which is that he compares a person, well, he uses this simile of saying that life is a, a projection like on a cinema screen. The screen is blank and life that you, you the, the adventures and ups and downs and highs and lows and specific things that happen to you are like the projection on the screen. The screen is blank and you're getting caught up in thinking that you're the characters on the screen when actually you are the light from the projector that is shining on the screen through the film that makes the, the picture on the screen. It's a rough simile and it's one that could only have existed in the, from the 20th century on. It's one that couldn't have existed in ancient times, but in ancient times they made similar sort of similes. And it's a quite interesting one that I'm not sure how to make of it. But what I found really interesting in this book is it, it awakened a lot of things that had occurred to me 15 or 20 years ago in my practice when things were starting to sort of bubble up and I was starting to understand what Zen practice was all about culminating in, in a few experiences that I've written about yet yeah, which which seems to have kind of passed in the intervening 20 or so years um, this sort of brought it all back in a way that was hard to avoid so in that case it was a, a turning word but let me see if I can go through a little bit of it when he talks about being alien and different from the body this is a way that they explain things in the Advaita Vedanta tradition that they don't commonly do in the Zen tradition. I remember a discussion I had with Tim, my first teacher, the guy who recommended this book to me, uh, because I was talking about that idea, I am not this body, which is which I was hearing from sort of Hindu tradition that I was reading about at the time when I first met him. And he said, well, maybe it's better to think of yourself as the body than to think of yourself as not the body. Now, that's a Zen way of thinking of it. Uh, neither one is the be-all and end-all. But the Zen tradition doesn't harp on this idea of being separate from the body because that gets into a kind of a, a dualistic point of view or mind and body are, are two different things, uh, which Zen does not go for, and neither does this Advaita Vedanta tradition. What Dogen says is more drop body and mind. So you are neither body nor mind, and actually Nisargadatta Maharaj does say that too. So the, the Advaita teachers will often harp on the idea of that you're not the body, but few of them say you're not the mind either. Well, Nisargadatta does, which makes him a little bit more like the Zen tradition in that sense. 
Merely assuaging fears and satisfying desires will not remove this sense of emptiness. I mean, this, this is so true and so obvious, and you see it all the time in people who are successful and rich and things. They, they can't escape their own desires. But the point that really got to me is your desire just happens to you, along with its fulfillment and non-fulfillment. You cannot change either. And desire is a kind of a big bugaboo in the Zen world. You know, there's that version of the Four Noble Truths in which it supposedly says desire is the cause of suffering, and to get rid of suffering you get rid of desire. Nishijima Roshi didn't uh, like that because he thought you can't really get rid of desire. And I would agree. I, I haven't seen any way to get rid of desire. On the other hand, your desire doesn't belong to you. That that seems to be the answer, as far as I can see. Well, the answer, one of the answers. Desire does not belong to you. You think the desire is my desire. What, whatever the desire is, whether it's the desire for a new car and a fancy house, or the desire not to live in a world that's as screwed up as you think this world is, or whatever the desire is, even those desires which seem to be natural and unavoidable, they're not yours. They're not my desire. So the fact that my desire is not being satisfied isn't a problem until I think that it's my desire, until I think that desire belongs to me and that something good will happen if it's satisfied and, and something bad will happen if it's not satisfied. I don't know what's going to happen, good or bad. But the desires don't belong to me. They're just the karma that I've accumulated. There's a, there's a reason this body and mind desire certain things. And it doesn't belong to me any more than this body and this mind belong to me, which don't belong to me either. They belong more to you than they do to me. That's a fact. That's just how it is. That's what tripped my trigger over the past few days, and I hope you've enjoyed it. If you want to continue tripping my trigger, you can send me a donation at the link that you're seeing on the screen, or to the Patreon and PayPal links that you can find below the screen if you're on YouTube. I thank you for those donations, because those are what is keeping things going in Casa Brad this year, and uh, the last few years, that's been a great source of my income. It really helps. If you're having big financial troubles, don't donate to me, because uh, things are not that desperate. They're hanging in there, so uh, so don't worry about it. But the reason I'm hanging in there is because of your contrib contributions. Thank you very much. See you later. Have a good time all the time. Bye.